blue and we are live but uh definitely not blue with uh blue balls uh this evening job how you doing i'm very good <laughs> very, <Unfortunately>. very good <laughs> unfortunately we couldn't get that gopro working so uh i know right got to deal with the webcam for one more stream we're gonna have yeah. another crack at fixing it after the stream sorry yeah. we spent an hour and a half trying to get you 1080p 60 fps <laughs> yeah an hour and a half trying to get it to work and uh we actually we actually did get it to work we got the video to work except we couldn't get There's the one the sound delay to on the work. audio yeah the one second delay on the audio is like oh no 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 yeah it's like <laughs> not something that's amazing and you know you can kind of tell in the corner of the stream here it's kind of smoky in here yeah, because that's what happens when uh, cooking uh, turkey uh, for some reason. So, Jab, what do we got tonight? What what do we got going on? Uh, who's uh, who's our target? Got, I think it's we've got J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling. I don't even know what J.K. even stands for. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. Okay. I call myself C.S. Joseph. Wait, <laughs> I can't judge. <laughs> yeah. Um. From memory, I watched one of her videos. The J is her first name. The K is her grandmother's name because she doesn't have a middle name, but she needed to have a, two initials to make it flow properly. And Rolling is her last name, I believe. So I don't even remember what they stand for, but it's probably not important as to what her type is, what her name is. So, all right. Let's... Well, Judith King Rolling, according to the audience, uh, and uh, Country Steak Joseph, apparently. And just kidding, Rolling. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just getting rolling. Makes sense. All right. Anyway, on that note, some context. Uh, so JK Rowling, somebody tweeted at her once, oh, my God, we're both INFPs. We, we can be best friends. And unfortunately, that person does not know much about Chase's compatibility. And then nope. JK Rowling replies, actually, I'm an INFJ, but we can still be friends, though. And unfortunately, J.K. Rowling still doesn't know about Chase's uh, <laughs> social compatibility because if that was the case, she'd say, actually, we're even more compatible than I'm an INFJ. So on that note, quick, take I don't know if she's actually an INFJ. I don't know if she's actually an INFJ. That's what we're going to figure out. Yeah, well, let's uh, and, let's poll the audience. What is the audience? Uh, let's let's see some uh, guesses from the audience in terms of J.K. Rowling's type. Let's Let's hear it. Johnny Cash rolling, really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. INFP, Caitlin T. The worst has ISFJ, INFP, procrastination, INFP. Interesting. Not hearing the the typical INFJ uh, thing that for like for some reason everyone else thinks she's an INFJ. So okay. So I, I'm going to have to put the audience vote at. Uh, Okay, well, they're all over the place. I would say INFP, but they're just kind of like everywhere. So fair enough. Cool. All right, ja all right. So let's let's actually talk about like what we're actually going to do. So uh, we're going to be uh, taking uh, things that she says in interviews uh, with people, and uh, what other kinds of clips we got tonight, Jeb? Just in general. Okay. Um, the first one we're going to go with is actually on YouTube called A Conversation Between J.K. Rowling and Daniel Radcliffe. Now, the reason why okay. I picked this is because it's not a traditional interview and it's more of a natural conversation, so we should see it flow a lot better than nice. question and answers. Nice. Um, but beyond that, I definitely do have some interviews. I've got her with uh, Oprah. I've got her... I've got another one called Conversation Between J.K. Rowling and Steve Cloves. I think Steve Cloves is an actor. No idea. No idea note, either. Excuse my ignorance. I got one with her and Jonathan Ross, and I've got one with her and Graham Norton. Her being British means that she uh, has more interviews with British people, so that's why they are, you know, predominantly British interviewers. But is she Anglo-Saxon or Scottish or Irish? We just don't know because for some reason it's all the same to us here in America. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we're going to be uh, determining her type, not her genotype. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I guess that is unfortunate. So uh, let's talk about uh, how we're actually going to do this. 
We're going All to right. be doing the type grid tonight. So we're going to be looking at uh, the temperaments and as well as interaction style uh, to try to uh, go through that. And for some reason, I uh, did not write interaction style here. So I'm just going to uh, write in right now. So because I was too busy worrying about the GoPro to actually figure that out. So we're going to have direct and then uh, informative. And then we're going to have initiating and then responding. Gotta love quartet markers. They like the dopest. And uh, then we got control. And then we have movement. Good. All right. How's that for slap sticking it together tonight? Uh, Doing it that way, and obviously red pen. So cool. Uh, interaction styles, temperaments. We're also going to be looking at uh, cognitive functions that we can pick out within her sentences, and just kind of get an idea of what type she is. And then we're going to kind of fire it off. So go for it, uh, Mr. Jab. Uh, grace us uh, with uh, her presence, I guess, in the clips that you have. Yeah, let's do it. Um... Yes, the first one's going to be the conversation with Daniel Radcliffe, which is the actor who plays Harry Potter. And on that note, let's go. Excellent. So, this is exciting. Yes, it is exciting. This is our chance to ask each other... What All the things we've asked each other off camera, but now do it in front of but the camera. But now do it in front of the camera, yeah. absolutely. And, try, and I'm going to try and be much more uh, profound and insightful than I ever have been go off camera. Go for it. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so I was... Yeah, seems no, more this responding is, this so is, far. This is uh, my chance where I realised that doing the interview yeah, is actually seems not responding. easy. responding. That's okay, we can swap. I can interview yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be brilliant. Um, okay, so I thought to begin at the beginning, how involved were you in the casting process and how much do I have to thank you for? Um, but do you remember working with involved, Chris? Or? Yeah, I, I, was I, I, was, involved, I, was, I was involved, not to the extent that I was sitting in, in on auditions, but they were keeping me really fully informed. As you know, we found Rupert and Emma and they were perfect and that was a done deal and we still couldn't find you. Will you say how you were found? Well, it, it was just, inc it was amazing, really. It's, it was a bizarre it was, kind it of was amazing, Originally, really. It was no, very S-E, very, very F-E-ish to a point. Okay, kind of T-I there. It was amazing. It's kind of what I'm going. I don't know, kind of a direct responding movement so far, as far as I can tell. Let's keep going. Keep going. So yeah, um, knew my dad because my dad had been a literary agent um, and my dad had worked with David's mum. And so David sort of asked my dad if I would audition. And the original deal was that we'd heard was going oh to be Oh my gosh, to do that guy is so informative. America, <laughs> it was all such a it's going to be done in America. No one ever told well, me that. Well, well, you know, well, thanks. Well, obviously, maybe that's why it changed because you probably put your foot down at some point or they just went, Joe, won't agree to that. Formative um, initiating movement. Oh gosh, shut up, Daniel Radcliffe. Let her talk. <laughs> She's bouncing off the walls. That's right, Brady Craig. <laughs> Damn. But um, I'm not somebody who particularly believes in fate and destiny and all those things, but my parents do. And so the final straw was the fact that I was I went to the theatre to see a production of Stones in His Pockets and David Heyman and Steve Clovis, who adapted all but one of the books, um, happened to be sitting in the row in front. You and, believe it? And I was, I was sat there oh the whole God. time thinking, why is that man? <laughs> yeah, that she tried to talk and he just kept talking. He just kept talking. He was like, <laughs> that guy is literally informative, initiating movement. I mean, he's like Kanye West 2.0. Like, is he in the NTP? <laughs> That's what I'm getting from that. <laughs> Dang. Let's keep going. Keep Staring at me. This at is me. very creepy. It was very <laughs> I, need, creepy. I need to phone someone. It was very odd. And, my, and I remember at the interval, my mum and my dad both looking kind of quite intense about something. Mm -hmm. But you know when as a kid, you're, you, you're aware that you're being purposely kept out of the loop, yeah. you know, for your own good kind of thing. And uh, I remember we went up the stairs and out of the theatre and then sort of hid behind a pillar. I seem to remember that it's an sort of absurd notion that David Amos and Steve Close were going to chase yeah, after us, you know, know rap <laughs> Oh, yeah, like and make you be a child actor. <laughs> um, and um, then there was some debate as to whether we would go back in for the second half, but I was really, really enjoying the play. Like... Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. so we went back in. And right. then the next you've got to make... like move away from that man and get back on her. Like, holy smokes. The guy is like, yeah. he's, 
that guy's a starter type. He's a TIFE user for sure, and he's SI. So, I mean, yeah, that's that's ENTP Daniel Radcliffe for you, in my opinion, unless he's an ESF. Sorry, type. guys. Trick you. This is a Daniel Radcliffe stream. Ha, ha, ha. I know, right? <laughs> unless, of course, he's a supporter, right. but whatever. All right. I think she's talking here, so I skipped ahead in like awesome. 10 seconds was on screen in my sitting room at home because really? they, yeah, they sent me a video of you and the, the curious thing is and I'm like I don't the curious you. thing is the curious thing yeah. so like yeah. NIS mm -hmm. curious yes okay and then more direct absolutely I think you make yeah. your own yeah but um so I saw you on um that audition tape and it was I had I don't think I've ever really told you that I found incredibly moving Thank you. So and much. and incredibly almost moving. I mean, -E incredibly moving. At that point, I didn't have a son. All right. yeah. So, and I phoned David up and I said, right. he's, um, yes. he's great, fantastic. And I rem I did say to David, it was like watching a son, my son on screen. Because after all, Harry felt like, feels like this ghost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Just how he reacted to that was like, whoa, that is so cringe. <laughs> Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, like, whoa, wait, 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 I'm your son that you never had? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the cringe is like yeah. super in there. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. Kind of affiliative ish, I'm thinking, but we'll see. Uh, let's, let's keep going. Yeah. Let's keep going. Mostly some that I've had in my life. But, you know, to be honest, you and Rupert and Emma are all too good looking, frankly. Oh, uh, you all are, you know, too good looking. And you. What's that, Essie? Yeah, a little Essie. Yeah. Maybe a little Essie oh. as well. Skip uh, Did you know that was going to happen? Did you sort of think they might? Idiot. I'm not an idiot. Yeah. I I'm, not an idiot. I'm not an idiot. I'm not an idiot. T.I. I'm lucky I spoke to Emma first on the phone before I met her because I fell absolutely in love with her. She <laughs> said to me, I've only ever acted in school drama plays before, and God, oh my God, I'm so nervous, I can't believe I've got a partner. And she spoke for like, like 60 seconds at least without drawing breath, and I just said, Emma, you're perfect. And then when I met her, and she was this you're very perfect. beautiful, which she still is, of course, a beautiful girl, I just kind of had to go, okay. I kind of saw, okay. saw her initiate there a little I bit. Guess. She's a little initiating, for sure. Yeah, it's a little initiating, that statement. So... Uh -huh. Yeah. You'll see my gawky, geeky, ugly duckling Hermione in my mind. But Do you think that in a way we, we shot ourselves in the foot with things like that for then Emma's reveal in the fourth film where she comes down and says, and there is supposed to have been this transformation. Well, exactly. Because and we're all looking going, well, she was already a beautiful girl. Yeah, big deal. Now yeah. she's a beautiful girl in a beautiful dress. Yes. Um, yeah. And putting her in fair isle sweaters in the first film didn't make her ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Not that Hermione in the books is ever ugly, but it was a, it was quite a big deal for me that I, I had written, you know, a, a strong female character yeah. who was primarily about brain yeah. and that she chose to become a little more yeah. groomed and glamorous as... as you know, us geeks do at a certain point <laughs> in our lives, but um, I accepted it. Us geeks do, that's a bit weak. Yeah. yeah Emma's a great actress, and I loved her as a person. Yeah. And I felt there were so many connections you between her, her and person, her. Person, very affiliative, very affiliative, very effy. Yep. Hermione, that, did it matter that she was beautiful? Come on. But it was interesting you mentioned about that audition because I was given a copy of my audition where I was um, there. What and it turns out because none, neither me, Rupert, and Emma could remember this, but it turns out we did all audition together once. They, there was a did screen you? test where they all tested us all at the same time, and I could hear Chris Columbus's voice. I didn't voice. know that. Um, S E T I. I believe be gone from the library right now. God, God, great work, guys. And I just remembered. God, he was brilliant. He was amazing with us. I like. I don't think anybody else could have got the enthusiasm out of those. Uh, He's just the nicest kids. guy in the world. Isn't nicest he? guy in the world. And a real world. family man. Oh, I remember man. meeting him and being. He is the nicest guy. In the I don't world. know where is, is not the right me? word, but obviously this is the person who's going to be taking my baby. And same way I felt when I met Steve Clovis, who I absolutely adore as well. The first but, I want you know, is going to be my baby. 
Oh, he's just such a such a nice guy. And I and the relief, both that my book would be in safe hands, but to be honestly, that you were all going to be in safe hands as well. Really, in England, you different. were going to be in safe hands. I see you again. Oof. Okay. In America, they treat you first and foremost as a star and then as a child, whereas actually you should be treated as a kid first and then an actor second. Do you think you had any idea that young of what, what, it, what you were really taking on? What you, you were really oh, taking no, on? That's abstract. I, I wasn't even fully aware of the scale of the no, phenomena right. at all. I mean, I, I had the first two read to me by my dad who incidentally did a great basilisk voice. Did he? Um, yeah, fantastic back in the day. I did actually at one point. I can actually imagine your dad too. Essay on Daniel's part, but we're not yeah. typing him. Yeah, we're not typing him, no. <laughs> yeah, my dad, um, my, uh, I did actually uh, suggest it to Chris Columbus, which my dad was completely mortified by. But oh, no, so I was, I was um, no, I don't think I could have ever had any. And even now, I don't actually think I have an understanding of how far it reaches because it is a case of not being able to see the wood for the trees. You know, it's, it's, I'm so much in the middle of it that I actually can't see how far out it stretches. I had exactly the same experience, although I think for a while I deliberately kept myself insulated from it. I didn't want to think about it. And when people, people would give me statistics, uh, so many books sold or so many um, territories covered, mm. and you just, you just think, I just want it to be me and my desk. I don't... Yeah. And, you know, again, people Very watch. Very responding, I've heard to say. Checks coming in. I'm sure you noticed this. <laughs> yes. And no, yes, and absolutely. I, I knew it was that there was a scariness and a pressure, and sometimes a weirdness about the. And you know this, and I know this. When people oriented. are obsessional about something, on the outer fringes, mm -hmm. you will you will have weirdness, you know, outer fringes. It's affiliative. Maybe don't want to when you just want to write your book. As you say, it's you with your desk. I'd rather be in my aircraft hangar. just want to the write your book. I just want, yeah. Yeah, let's move okay. on to the next. Let's do move on to Oprah. No. Like, Dan, Daniel Radcliffe is <laughs> triggering me right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically how you sound to all of us. So uh, calm down, sir. Yeah, well, yeah, I get it. I mean, uh, who'd have thunk that... Uh, Daniel Radcliffe was uh, uh, that one. So <laughs> that one, you don't even want to say it. <laughs> no, I don't want to say it. <laughs> All right, so we got Oprah now. Let's move into it. Yeah, let's do it. Oprah, let's fire it off. Joe Kathleen. Joanne Kathleen. And fool the yeah. boys Joanne for Kathleen. a while. Yeah, there we go. not for too long. Not for too long. Yeah, because I started giving my picture in the press and no one could pretend I was a man anymore. Yes, and I don't think the boys have minded. No, it hasn't held me back, has it? It's <laughs> clearly not held me back. <laughs> not a bit. When we came, um, just arrived yesterday, it was beautiful. Scotland's <laughs> beautiful. It's stunning. It's well, it's stunning. Yeah. And the yeah. green is greener than any green I've ever seen. It's gorgeous. Other than Ireland. Yes. Other than Ireland. Yeah. 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 So I can understand why you love being here. Is there something about being here in this particular hotel where we are that you thought would be particularly stimulating to your creative process? And that's why you wanted to come here to finish? Well, it turned out to be stimulating. As I was finishing Deathly Hallows, there came a day where the window cleaner came, the kids were at home, mm -hmm. um, the dogs were barking, and I, I could not work. And this light bulb went on over my head and I thought, I can throw money at this problem. I can now solve this problem. Mm -hmm. For years and years and years, I just would go to a cafe and sit in a different kind of noise and work. Mm -hmm. I thought, I can go to a quiet place. So I came to this hotel. I could go to a, a quiet hotel, place. But they were so nice to me here. And I, I, I think writers can be a little bit superstitious. So the first day's writing went well. So I kept coming back to this hotel and I ended up finishing the last Books in this hotel. We have a lot of things in common. Yeah. First of all, you know, this is the last year that I'm doing the Oprah show. Yeah. I will go on and do other things. Mm -hmm. But when I came to the end of Hallows, the last trace of steam evaporated in the autumn air. The train rounded a corner. Harry's hand was still raised in farewell. He'll be all right, murmured Ginny. As Harry looked at her, he lowered his hand absentmindedly and touched the lightning scar on his forehead. I know he will. The scar had not pained Harry for 19 years. All was well. When I came to the end of that, I mourned not oh only for the gosh, end. Oh my gosh, Oprah, please. 
Please. I cannot imagine what that was like. Mm-hmm. It was huge. I can't imagine. I kept, um, I, it, it was a bereavement. It was, it, was, it was a bereavement. It was huge. Mm-hmm. But I think one way, although I knew it was coming, mm-hmm. we all know that the people we love are mortal. We all know we're mortal. Mm-hmm. We know it's going to end. Mm-hmm. You cannot prepare yourself for mm-hmm. it. So even though I'd always known it would be seven books, that was it. I'd, I knew how it was going to end. When it ended, I was in a slight state of shock. Mm. What did you do when you finished? Well, that? initially I was elated, but then there came a point I cried, as I've only ever cried once before in my life, and that was when my mother died. Mm. It was uncontrollable, and I'm not a big crier. You know, I, I cry, I'm but I'm not a big someone. Crier. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what no I mean? Way. Some people can. Hours. Yeah. I've never, only twice in my life have I done that. Mm-hmm. For 17 years, I'd had that through some very tumultuous times in my personal life. And I, you know, I'd always had that. Mm-hmm. And if it was an escape for all these children, you can imagine what it had been for me. Mm-hmm. And it was not and just. If it was an escape for these children, you can imagine what it was for me. Working. And it was the uh, structure it gave to my life. And I knew I'd still be writing, but I had to mourn Harry. It did was you know my... all as well was going to be the last line? Yeah, I did. And you always knew that? Well, hmm, that's a really good question, because for a long time, the last word was going to be star. But it was just, it was just, a, it was, it was just worded differently. Mm-hmm. But I, there, and I had said that to fans, the last word would be scar. And then I changed my mind. I, I, I just wanted the last words to be... All as well. All as well, mm-hmm. Yeah. But you know what happens I want it. ever and after. I, yeah, yeah I, I do. I. I, couldn't stop. I don't think you can. When you've been that involved with characters for mm-hmm. that long, it's still all in there. They're all in my head still. I mean, I could write. I, I could. Very abstract. I could definitely write. I could, easily. Could. Will yeah. you? They're all still part of me. I'm not going to say I won't. Mm-hmm. I don't think I will. I loved writing those books. I, I love writing I will. So I feel I, I am done. But you never know. Tell Future me, space. did you ever feel that you had to succumb to the pressure? Because when you first started, mm-hmm. the first one, the world didn't know. Yeah. And afterwards, once the deals are made in the industry mm-hmm. and the entire universe mm-hmm. of Harry Potter began, I'm sure the pressure was overwhelming at times. Yeah, it was. It, yeah, it was. I can say that now. Mm-hmm. Because I'm free of it. At the time, I felt a need to deny how great the pressure was because that was my way of coping. Mm -hmm. It happened so fast for me. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't have happened. You know, this was a children's book. A children's book, moreover, that I'd been told repeatedly wasn't very commercial because I'd been turned down a lot. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I went from utter obscurity. That seems like a pessimistic FI, isn't it? It was like being a beetle. Yeah, it is. It came a point where it's crazy. She doesn't, yeah. So let's let's go over what our data we have right now, Jeb. Just, let's just go over it with the audience here. So uh, <clears throat> we've identified expert intuition, expert sensing, expert thinking, and expert feeling as the functions that she's used most in the conversation. So we've identified the quadra, which is STP or NFJ. Uh, so uh, now based on this, we got abstract and affiliative, uh, and both these types are pragmatic, so she's not an ST by STP by default, so it's between ENFJ or INFJ at this point. They're both direct, uh, and uh, they're both uh, abstract, interest, and affiliative based. So definitely, an NF is our temperament for sure. So which oh, they're already NFs as it is. So at this point, we just have to determine her interaction style. Is she direct, initiating, control? or is she direct responding movement? Now, Jab, I've seen in this conversation and what we've looked at so far, more movement for sure. It's really hard to mm-hmm. determine uh, initiating versus responding because there's a few times she was initiating, there's a few times she's responding, I and mean, obviously she's in the interviewer role. You know what I mean? So it's right. a little different. Definitely direct for sure, but both of those types are direct anyway, so fair enough. So we just got to figure out if she's initiating, responding, or control versus movement at this point. So let's just uh, focus all our energy on that. Um, so uh, mm-hmm. do you have the uh, do you have the, do you have a different clip we can look at? Kind of skip. Sure. Away. All right, I've got. Um, 
a conversation between J.K. Rowling and Steve Close. I think that's another actor, so it's more of a conversation setting. We might be able to get the the, the initiating All correctly right. done. Yeah. Play something really quick. Okay, so yes, let's go. I mean, still, I still hadn't melted completely though. Yeah, well, I know, yeah, I know. And the then moment, you yeah. said to me. You know who my favorite character is. Yeah, and I, that just was spontaneous. And I realized I don't think I'd ever acknowledged it even to myself. I remember very specifically leaning over to you and saying, I think I need to tell you that Harry is not my favorite character. Which and, was fine. And I didn't know what you thought. I later learned that you thought that I was going to say. I thought you said, you know who my favorite character is? And I thought, oh, he was going to say Ron. Yeah. And I love Ron. Uh, but Ron's oh, no, so love, love easy to love. He's so easy to love. You know, love. everyone loves. Who couldn't love Ron? And I thought, okay, you love Ron. And then okay, I said, and then you said uh, the, Hermione, and it was true because I Hermione was melted. the character that, and it stayed throughout oh. um, because I think she had such this huge intelligence, but it was really. A kind of exasperating, frustrating character in a way, though, that was like the girl that bothered you in school. Yeah, <laughs> but you totally. couldn't stop She's thinking about her. So, um, not always the easiest to like. Very no, but, I, but I, I like that about her. That's um, what I liked about her. Yeah, the, I know. But that you can see how that allayed a lot of fears because she wasn't the most obvious character, perhaps, for a person to like or say was their favorite character. And also for a man to like her best was arguably unusual. You've got dirt on your nose, by the way. Yep, that was Did initiating. You know? But the thing I liked about all the characters was that they were misfits mm. and almost no more than she. Mm. Um, and because she had no pedigree at all to be there. No. And I thought we've all, I certainly, you know, Hollywood is that way, is that there's no... I was just going to say, no exactly interest, like me no, sitting at that lunch. Who would have thought? Oh, I was no just interest. going to say, very yeah, initiating. Like you say, I'm here. So, Jab, do you think, uh, do you think, like, so we just listened to her talk to, uh, what's his name again? Something close? What's Daniel Radcliffe. So Who? Daniel Radcliffe? No, no, the guy she's talking to right now. Oh, Steve Cloves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, so Steve, he's like, you know, they're talking about Ron Weasley. Oh, he's a, he's a so likable character, right? And uh, he said Hermione and then J.K. Rowling just lights up at the uh, at the whole notion, right? And it's like, oh, wow, you liked my girl character because she's very smart, right? And if you're an NFJ, right, which NFJ of the two NFJs here typically are told that they're stupid by other people? Well, as we lear recently learned in season 16, episode four about the inferior function, TI inferiors, right? They get really sensitive around people who, you know, call them stupid, right? So it kind of makes sense given how people live vicariously through their subconscious, right? Uh, that she would write a character that's very TI hero oriented within Hermione, right? Or very high TI, right? And that's why it just kind of melts her heart a little bit more, you know, uh, when when someone like Steve, who's close to her, obviously, chooses Hermione as, as their favorite character instead of the cliche, you know, Ron setup. Because you can kind of tell that she sort of is trying to live vicariously through the character of Hermione as a result of, you know, potentially, you know, other people telling her that she's, you know, stupid as a result of that. So uh, okay, so that was a great, and I'm going to let you finish, but that episode hasn't premiered yet and no one but me and you have watched. No, no, that's, that's the nemesis function. I'm that's episode five. That hasn't prepared till like Friday and sorry, audience, not sorry for setting up as a premiere. I'm experimenting with that uh, new premiere setting that we have on YouTube, et cetera, so that I can like watch the lecture with all of you at the same time. So anyway, Jab, let's keep moving on. Let's look for more initiating uh, versus responding and uh, control versus movement for sure. Uh, do you want new clip or keep going on this one? Uh, keep going on this one. No, and you were very direct. Which I, you were, <laughs> which you were very respectful, but you were very direct. And I thought this is a good thing, and I thought it was going to be good for us um, because I think there are a lot of writers of books who are just happy to have a deal with Hollywood. Mm. And, and by the way, I understand. I think it was Jane Smiley or someone who just said, "You have my book now. I'm leaving because I can't watch this." It was someone like that, and I think that that that's a one way to deal with it. It is one way to deal but with it. You clearly were not going to be that way, but you also were. You were respectful of everyone, but I think you weren't just going to sit there 
and let someone say something foolish. People have forgotten this. There were still people talking about could we cast an American yeah, and stuff. Definitely and, at that point. Definitely. You know, but I was violently against that, and I, you were as well. That, that Ron, for some reason, was the one they thought everyone could thought be, Ron American. be American. I don't How know why. How is that going to work? And I think that there was um, a feeling that Harry needed to be to be a little more Ron like. Yes. I remember that coming up a few times. Let's make Harry more of a wisecracker. And you said early on, you said Harry is our eyes onto the world. That's his function. His yeah. primary function yeah. is as the observer, which was perfect, which is exactly as it is in the books. Initially, you see the magical world through the eyes of a kid who has zero knowledge. Welcome, Harry, to Diagon Alley. So yeah, that's, that's how you... It's a bit more movement. Very much mm. more movement in that interaction for sure. And uh, I think it's possible uh, that uh, she might be like, because she's like, or uh, he, Steve's like, oh, you know, you were really direct. You were really taking control of the situation. Yeah. And you were very respectful. I mean, sure. that, But that kind of feels more like ESTP subconscious to me instead of ISTP subconscious, you know, willing to right. aspire and, and take control in that situation instead of it being ENFJ ego and and be and be in control or and, and take the lead from ENFJ ego. ENFJ ego is not really going to do that as much because it's all about the experience or the event or how everyone feels presently, whereas the ESTP is present to actually get the job done, right? And and to do it right the first time uh, with a little bit more precision, with a, li a bit more precision. And given the insanely high value placed in the characters, FI Critic would actually be chiming in there as well. So there's a chance of that. So let's keep listening. All right. You enter the, the yeah. well, and that's so precisely how the, the scripts were in, in, in the yeah. beginning, all from Harry's point of view for for a very, very long time. Exactly. I, what I thought you had done brilliantly was balanced. And one of the things I tried to say to people was, you know, Ron and Hermione are so obviously colourful, mm -hmm. interesting characters. Mm -hmm. and, and Harry's a bit of a blank slate. He is. I'm just Harry. Just Harry. Well, just Harry. Did you ever make anything happen? I think that's why different cultures are able to project onto him um, what they want him to be. And I think it's why I've always respected Dan enormously. Because he's the hardest totally, character for me to write. Totally agree. And he's is, he, the is he the hardest character for you? Was he the hardest character for you to write in terms of? No, the, but uh, but it's the archetype no, of the hero, isn't it? No, hero so that's often. Like, that is so direct. That's not really a TI inferior response. No, you know, that's, that's more of a stronger TI child uh, as a result. Right. Let's keep going. It's like the Galahad figure, isn't yeah. it? The, 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 the guy without the quirks. The guy yeah. who simply, he's the vessel. He's the vessel. Dan is the vessel. Yeah. Um, and the hardest to play by a mile. And Dan's Absolutely. just done a magnificent Absolutely. job with it. And I, you know, I'm glad to see he latterly has has got more credit for that. Well, I also I think, think he's in, done a great job. In the, in the last picture in particular, um, I mean, I think Dan's been brilliant all throughout, but he's so good in the last movie. Yeah, he's stunning. And he and it's honestly, Completely it's in the brilliant. silent moments. Yeah. I mean, where he's just, you so see good. on his face, the the price that he's paid exactly. for all these years. Exactly. And he's really brilliant. But to convey that was more difficult in his case. Well, you I know. think that was always something I felt you had a harder job than I did. Because inevitably, film being the visual medium it is, so much of what I could do with Harry was have an internal soliloquy. You know, I could show yes. Harry's inner musings. I could take the reader into Harry's internal space and show them around this character whose life is maybe 80 percent internal you're forced to show us that externally so i always felt that you had a much rougher job than i did when it came to harry the character you're talking about trying to to dramatize that internal life when mm -hmm. i first started writing the script when he was in the um in the cupboard i uh, i invented oh, yeah. a spider named yeah. alistair who he talked to and he used to fit he yeah. used to sort of nip broken soldiers out of the rubbish bin this, yeah. and he lined them up on the shelf and this broken army that you know that um, Dudley had thrown out. It is such a great image, the broken army. And he used to talk to them. And what, what the whole point was that he, he seemed slightly mad mm. when I wrote the first draft. And then when so when Hagrid appeared, you thought it was out of his imagination for a minute that he had he had summoned well, this guy. I think guy. that's a fabulous point, and that that speaks so perfectly to the truth of the books because I've had it great. suggested to me more than once. That Harry actually did go mad in the cupboard, and, and that everything that happened subsequently yeah, is some sort of movement. fantasy life he developed to save. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hmm. 
I, I mean, what do you think, Jeb? I'm just not really seeing much control with her. I mean, I saw a few control here and there, but mostly I'm seeing movement. Obviously, she's direct, and it's really hard to really determine initiating versus responding. Um, like, if she had her, like, it almost seemed like she had an NI hero and like, oh, you know, yeah, and then I'm going to go on to this, you know, uh, this path now. This is the best path for me to take to answer this question, and I parent not so much. And she's not, like, really trying to you know, make him feel good as much. It just kind of seems like there's Effie pessimistic parent in there, you know? So, I mean, what do you think, Jab? Do you, do you disagree or uh, are you getting any control in there or are you seeing most of the movement? Um, I'm seeing a bit of movement, but I'm also looking more at the responding initiating and I'm definitely seeing the initiating and the responding, but the responding just seems a bit more natural. Yeah, the responding does seem a lot more natural, and I'm thinking she's able to oscillate pretty easily between her subconscious and uh, and her ego on a regular basis. I mean, you'd have to do that, especially like if you're one of the most famous writers of all time and you're working on eight films, for example, you kind of have to have some semblance of control or some semblance of leadership as a result there. And obviously, you would have to have a developed subconscious to actually be able to pull that off, right? And uh, it just... It, and also, you know, uh, kind of a little bit ENFP shadowish, a little bit too, uh, in terms of, you know, hey, this is what I need right now. This is what I'm going to do. You know, if you want to do it, great. Otherwise, you know, we're just going to do it my way and then flip the ESTP. It's under control, et cetera. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, but uh, but again, in, in, in an interview format, you know, when you're in an introverted situation like this, informing and or uh, responding versus initiating is really hard to pinpoint because it's like, oh, okay, you know, because you can't observe her in a distance or you can't observe her in a crowd and basically how she is. I mean, if we had some clips of her amongst many people at the same time and their attention is not on her per se, you know, it makes it a little difficult. But the fact that their attention is on her, you know, so much, you know, it, it kind of brings out the subconscious potential is what I'm thinking. So, uh, so yeah, it, I, right now I'm leaning more towards INFJ at this point. So uh, do you have a different clip we can look at to gather some more evidence uh, so we can at least verify? Yep. Okay. Friday night with Jonathan Ross. Here we go. All right. I have read the new Harry Potter book, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. And personally, Joe, I think you've done better than And okay, It Was All a Dream. <laughs> <laughs> and we have guests of the series out, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Parents, brace yourself in a fortnight. You'll have 700 pages of bedtime story to get through. Will you please welcome J.K. Rowling? <laughs> My grandmother's name, they wanted a second initial, so I took Kathleen. And is it to, make, name. It to make it sound more highbrow blokey. or more blokey? Yeah, they thought it was a book that would, the first book would appeal to boys. If you had the, the double and they initial. Did, yeah, they thought maybe they'd be turned off by a woman writing. Her that is not the, uh, authoritarian there. Part. Yes, she's and a I, woman. Yeah, but I didn't know, I thought, we didn't know what the name should form. We asked our kid, and she said maybe it stands for Animal Sounds. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a great name for someone, Animal Sounds. Animal How sounds. Do you do? Uh, yeah. Well, Joe, thank you for coming on the show. I'm a huge fan of the books. Obviously, Thanks. the kids have adored them. And, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of just about everyone in the country, I think, when I say just how magnificent they are and what a, what a lovely contribution you made to our life, really. Oh, it's it's so, genuinely, I feel honored to have you here. So thank oh. you for coming on. J.K. Rowling, who has... Thank you. <laughs> And also, I'm delighted you're here because I know you, you don't really give a lot of interviews. Don't no, you? No. No. Do you find it easier now, though? Is it something you've just got more accustomed to the attention, or is it because the whole um, thing's behind you? You finish the books. I think finishing the books, it, it's definitely been a release. I feel more relaxed. I thought I could come on here now and crash and burn and what's finishing. <laughs> finishing. How much? She has mentioned mm -hmm. that multiple times where her focus has been on finishing more than anything. Like getting it behind her so she can relax. Yeah. It's almost like she's in constant state of stress on the, until she finishes what she's doing. Sounds she like sounds like someone I know who's like the co-host of the stream as a chart the course finishing type. Sounds like something that you would describe to me on a regular basis, Jab. <laughs> mm. If only I could start things. Yeah, if only. Hard knock life. Indeed. Anyway, keep going. Yep. 
of your life have you spent with those books, with those characters? 17 years. 17 years? Yeah, I was 25 when I had the idea. Wow. And, yeah. and how long between you having the idea mm-hmm. and the first book being finished and then published? Right? Um, seven years. So, that's so quite... I've been published 10 years. That's a long journey you went on it just huge, to get it out there. Huge, huge. Uh, mm-hmm. And the, the first book, is it why you came up with the idea for the book? You were, you were on a train? I was on a train. I, I don't even know what I was thinking about, and the idea just came into my head. Okay. Um, before we talk about Howie and the, the huge journey. Yeah, yeah, a coaches, lot more responding yeah. in that interaction. Yeah. That guy is very initiating uh, alone, um, whereas, like, you know, Oprah's kind of initiating as well. But the last guy, Steve, he seems kind of more of a responding person and then allowed her to initiate more so. So, I mean, she's definitely cognitive transitioning between, you know, based on the interview format, et cetera. So it's hard to pinpoint initiating versus responding. But how she's uh, responding, she does kind of seem a bit more SE inferior in that conversation because she doesn't know that person. She doesn't have that relationship with that guy. Whereas, you know, in an SE inferior would kind of like, it's unfamiliar, right? Uh, an SE child wouldn't really bother about that at all. They'd be more, you know, flamboyant in their, in their talk. Um, and I'm still seeing, Jab, I'm still seeing more movement all the way across the board. I'm still seeing more movement. And I like at this point, I'm happy to just ignore initiating and responding entirely and just be like, oh, direct move it. And she's talking about finishing all the time. So hashtag finisher, which basically means INFJ uh, as her type. I mean, yeah. at this point, Jab, I think it's pretty obvious. I mean, I get that the audience disagrees with me, but I mean, like the audience almost always disagrees with me anyway. So, I mean, what are you gonna do, right? Right. I mean, you want yeah, to keep going I for mean, verification, but I, at this point, I'm just, I'm not seeing enough control to really warrant her being in control. I'm just not seeing it, you know, and. Uh, right. She's definitely movement. She's yeah. definitely movement of control. Um, whilst she seems to respond or initiate depending on the circumstance, and that's probably as a result of what we have available to us. Most of her social interactions we have are interview style formats. Yeah. So she's obviously bounced between initiating and responding, depending on whether the person is initiating or whether the person is responding. However, I will say I can personally sense that responding seems more natural. To her. Yeah, definitely more natural with your expert in sensing yourself. And I, and it would seem like comparing a past experience with myself between actual ENFJs that I know and INFJs. I mean, I've had the opportunity to share a bed with, either the type, for example, and being that intimate with them. And my personal experiences uh, with both of those people at uh, different times in my life, uh, absolutely, uh, she more identifies with the INFJs that I have known, uh, the INFJ women that I have known more so than the ENFJ ones, for sure. Based on you know what I'm seeing, comparing that with TE uh, T. critic and my SI inferior, it's definitely uh, more towards uh, the INFJ side. And yes, while sure. I understand that she has publicly said, oh yeah, I am an INFJ, et cetera. Okay, yeah, sure. You know, that's a little bit different. Yeah, I mean, the that herself, like the fact that she said that herself is more indicative and more supportive of a TI child because TI inferior would be like more open to like changing the belief of what she actually is and would have to spend even more time verifying it and would always be willing to retake a test per se instead of just directly saying nope it's this which is more of a ti child uh, point of view and when when considering ti child versus ti inferior i'm seeing a lot more ti child uh present for for sure uh as a result of this interaction and uh yeah, I mean, and the fact, again, she's she's very finished, focused on finishing, talking about finishing. It just comes out in her words how finishing was the most important thing to her. And, uh, yeah, I, it, it makes sense. It really, really makes sense. When you're someone like her who had, was very downtrodden and had a rough life uh, to start, you're more, you know, in your shadow, you're very shadow focused individual, which you talk about in season 16, episode five, which comes out on Friday. Uh, that kind of right. shadow integration uh, uh, kind of gives the uh, finisher types the ability to actually start, especially like uh, the INJs, because they have ENP shadows. So they actually could start a little bit, and then it's the most important thing to them. And then they actually spend the rest of the time finishing. And then after that finishing, it's like, oh, I can relax now, etc. Whereas, you know, if, if she really was an ENFJ, I'd be able to argue INFP 
um, shadow, which I mean, it's more philosophical, you know, it, she would have a more philosophical approach with what she's saying uh, in terms of Harry Potter and, and her stories and what they mean to her. It would be, uh, it would be form a more, even more meaningful approach, right. With a, with an actual philosophy that she's trying to convey, at, uh, you know, when, as uh, it seems like her priority is actually to just, uh, you know, give people what they want in terms of conveying a good story and, and be precise with giving a good experience to the audience instead of necessarily conveying a message per se. It seems to be a different priority, which again would, uh, would uh, support, um, you know, the theme of INFJ because it's not as philosophical per se, right? Uh, if she was an ENFJ, it would actually be a little bit more philosophical and also uh, sh what she would be doing would be kind of more formulaic because, or mechanical per se, from an ISTP subconscious point of view, seeing ISTP uh, subconscious uh, right, it's it's very simple. It's actually very simple uh, of an approach. Whereas, uh, you know, her subconscious is more, uh, it, 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 there's, there's some complexity there with the structure, right? Uh, because uh, with the structure that she's on. And she actually talks about the structure and how she has to take charge consistently to keep the precision of what she's writing into the films. Like we heard that, she talked about that earlier tonight in one of the clips that you provided. That dedication to precision and to perfection to the point where she's, I'm gonna be respectful, but I'm still gonna take control as the source of the content here for these films, you will listen to me, right? That's a very ESTP persuader subconscious approach because INFJs, per, they don't want to have any anxiety about their performance, especially when it comes, like she said, the visual portrayal of the films because she is dedicated to giving the absolute ideal experience to the audience. Whereas an ENFJ, not so much. An ENFJ is more focused on being right. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. more being more focused about, you know, uh, how the experience is going to be conveyed because they're willing to just be mechanical with their experience provided they're right. Because oftentimes ENFJs have to spend so much time in their lives proving to everyone else that they're correct. And that's what she would be doing if she's talking about, oh, I'm an INFJ and I need to prove to everyone else that I'm an INFJ. No, she doesn't care. She just says, I'm an INFJ and that's it. That's very TI child, right? Very TI mm -hmm. child. So... Right. Anyway, that's just kind of the uh, the approach uh, that they're taking. Um, and no, I'm not saying INFJs are like full of rainbows and unicorns. I mean, everyone has their flaws here. But just just in this case, you know, getting a read on her, that's definitely what I'm seeing. So anyway, Chase's judgment for this evening on J.K. Rowling is INFJ uh, based on all the evidence that we have at this time. So that's that's where I'm at yep. with it, Jeb. Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree with you. Just, yeah. I've been trying to look at that responding, definitely responding, definitely movement. Or direct over informative, like, whenever someone would make a statement she'd disagree with, she would immediately say, no, and then follow up with, because, X, Y, Z, instead of just starting off at, yeah, like, responding with a story, and then once you hear the whole story, then if you do some mental gymnastics, then you can figure out the moral of the story is actually the answer to the question, like an informative type would. Um, very direct. Definitely affili affiliative. If you look at her Twitter, it's basically a bunch of political activism. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and as Strawberry Lolly point out, she does interrupt a lot, which is very typical of T.I. Child. T.I. Child, that T.E. trickster, constantly interrupts. Whereas T.I. Inferior and T.E. Demon, not really, because they're pessimistic with their thinking. Uh, they're just, they're too pessimistic. They're not really going to interrupt. They're going to, as each child is going to wait to see what other people have to say first and then kind of respond as a result. But T.I. Child, it's it's optimistic. It's all about what it thinks. It's definitely going to, uh, to, uh, uh, to interrupt, basically. And uh, that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly normal, so... Cool. Well, yeah. I think uh, 
I think that's everything for this uh, stream tonight, folks. Uh, we're going to be back 9 p.m. Eastern, hopefully with the GoPro working this time on uh, on Thursday night for our next Q&A session. Make sure you're on the Discord session to be able to put in your uh, uh, questions and answers in the Q&A channel. Uh, also, uh, we have our book list now. If you don't know, the book list is on the website. Just go to csjoseph.life and click books. Scroll down. You will see books. It's basically everything in my library is there, and you'll see what I'm reading right now, etc. I usually read about four to five books at a time, uh, so that's pretty cool to have that opportunity to see all of them there. So, Awesome. Thank you all for joining. Yep. Uh, Jab, you got any words to say before we close out? Um. No, thank you all for coming. Um, we've got the major ones I've been wanting to do out of the way. Be sure to keep uh, sending suggestions uh, yeah. in chat, in the comment sections, or on Discord. We have a we have a subsection for suggestions. Yeah, and uh, like Jordan Peterson is coming, just not yet. So <laughs> we'll get We're to him. Get I promise. A couple more out the way, and then we'll get to him. Like, yeah, for sure. <laughs> It's kind of on the back burner for reasons. Yeah, for reasons. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> because reasons. Opioids. Seven. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, Connor McGregor. That's actually a really good idea. Uh, might do that one next. Uh, thank you, Brandy, for that suggestion. That's that's actually a really good idea. Um, that goes back to uh, my arguments with Fate Win and a few other people from season one back in the day. So that sounds great to me. All right, uh, sounds good. Uh, see you all Thursday night, 9 Eastern. Hopefully we start on time and we actually have the GoPro working. Otherwise, uh, have a good night. And don't forget our premiere of season 16, episode five, this Friday night as well. So see you all there. Later. <laughs>